who you say I am. I need to readjust this yet again. Uh, let me add to also, um, a couple of weeks ago when Pastor was up here last before our hiatus, he shared with you about being on time and how difficult it is sometimes to get that sermon on time. Well, let me tell you the reason why, and of course I had a refreshment on that, is that once a pastor gets into the Word, there's so much good stuff there, and you want to share all of it with everybody. But um, we don't always have that kind of time. So I'm going to try real hard not to keep you all over. But uh, if I do, just forgive me ahead of time because hopefully it's all good stuff. I want to start with a question this morning. And the question is, do you know who you are? I see some heads shaking, some smiles. Y'all may be thinking, I've lost my mind. I mean, she knows us. She's known us all for a very long time. And I, I do know you. But I'm not talking about here about your name. I'm not talking about what you do for a living. I'm not talking about how the world identifies you. My question is directed at who you are in the deepest part of your heart. I'm not asking what makes you tick or what excites you or even what you're passionate about. What I'm asking is, what is your identity? I'm talking about what makes you you, what makes you who you are, and who are you following to keep being who you are. Now, as I look out over physically over those that are present this, this morning, I mostly know all of you and, and a lot about you. I mostly know um, how you've been, where you've been, who you are, and who you'll be tomorrow, and even next week, next month, next year, or until God takes you home, okay? But uh, I have no idea who our young people will be when they grow up, and I have no idea who the people that join us each week on the Internet are or will be tomorrow or next week or next year. Those are things that only God knows. And in thinking about this topic today, for me personally, my identity is something that I have never had to search for. I've pretty much always known where I came from and where I wanted to go and what I wanted to be. I've never been confused about my being, my worth, my self-esteem, my gender, or my purpose. I've never had to search for who I am, and that's a blessing. Being blessed by being born into a Christian family that stressed discipleship. That's being a follower of Jesus Christ, and that's always been a part of my identity. So it's a huge part of who I am. But what I'm seeing today in our world is that there are generations of people who haven't had the guidance that I've had, and they're searching for this answer of who they are and what their purpose is. So answering this question, who you are, is a huge, vital issue today. There are questions such as, who am I deep inside? What is my purpose for being here? And there are people that are they're confused over the answers because they're hearing so many different things coming at them. They're confused by whom they should believe and whom they should trust to answer these questions. Now, off the top of my head, with all the stuff I've read and studied and been in webinars for, there's at least two generations that are very deeply searching for who they are. Their search, in fact, is changing the face of America in many ways. And the repercussions are that it's changing the face of our world in many ways as well. Along their journey, they've discovered some really good things. I mean, we, our world has become a better place because of some of these searching changes that have been brought about. While at the same time, there's some confusion through all the searching. And the problem with confusion is that it sets a precedence and lays a foundation for those that come after them. I believe the root of the problem is where they are looking and to whom they are looking to for the answers to these questions. And I, I want to make a disclaimer here. When I say they, I'm not separating anybody into factions. I'm just saying that all of us have been a they at some point in their life. I mean, I think back on, on my mom when, 
when the music I brought into the house was not the music she had listened to. And she couldn't understand a word of it, you know? I'm there today. I'm that person now. I listen to music on the radio, and I'm like, I don't understand what they're saying. Um, so we were all a day at one time. Many of our younger generations have given up on the older generation for direction and for their answers. Part of the problem is that there are so many single parent homes that the idea of marriage that lasts till death do us part has, for the most part, ceased to being something that they hope for, which has degraded the family unit and it's added to the questions that they're asking and to the purpose that they're searching for. Personally, having so much material blessings has been a, a good thing for me, but for these new generations uh, that have been blessed materially, they're taking it for granted because they're not in touch with those people that paid the cost so that we might have these blessings. Therefore, they're removed from those people that should be appreciated. And enough of our politicians and famous actors and athletes and ministers and other prominent figures, they've been caught up in public scandals and disgraced. And that makes it hard for them to know who to trust. And so this lack of distrust in leadership has formed. And with the availability of the internet that is constantly changing, change is the only thing that these generations feel that they can trust. You know, nothing is set in stone. And given this lack of trust, many have begun to form their own answers and their own truths about who they are and about why they're here, what their purpose is. The answer to these questions are crucial because the answer to these questions form the way we see the world, which forms the way we live because it forms what we do. It forms how we behave and how we react to the world that we live in. In essence, who we believe we are shapes everything we do. For me, it feels like much of the world lives in this constant state of confusion about who they are and about why they're here. And it makes me anxious, the not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. Without answers to these tough questions, it's like these people, or people in general, are lost in a minefield that could blow up at any minute and blow them up and blow them in a direction that they don't want to go, that they don't need to go, and that they shouldn't go. And it's not that people aren't searching for right answers, because they are. But the failure to find the right answer is the result of not listening to that still, small voice inside their hearts that every day is calling out to them, that every day is making itself known in some form, some fashion. This voice implores them to hear the truth, and this truth will meet their need. This truth will answer their questions. This truth can only be found in Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, we are left to wander through our lives and believe and buy into the lies that Satan has prompted others to believe and to act on. Lies that form a false sense of purpose, a false sense of identity, a false sense of security, and a false sense of happiness. And as I said, I've never questioned my identity because I've always known that I'm a child of God. And because I'm a child of God, his purpose is my purpose. I didn't have to go looking for a purpose. Now that doesn't mean I haven't had questions. The difference for me is in who I went to with my questions and who I waited on to give me the answers. Now, when I think about my search for identity, my mind races in many different directions and I, I really want to help others find who they are so that they can have the peace and contentment that Jesus Christ has given to me. Uh, the peace that Jesus gives will take away the fear that the world gives to them. The peace of Christ will take away the confusion that the world is giving to them. The peace of Christ will take away their anger or their self-absorption that the world is prompting them to participate in. Because I know that until the answer to this question is found, I also know that the world's going to continue to search for something that they are never going to find. They'll continue to accept what the world tells them 
is the truth. They will continue to manufacture their own answers and they'll continue to act according to their own truth in hopes of finding peace, purpose, happiness. But let's look deeper at that question of who am I? And I've already said, uh, personally, I know I'm a creation of God, meaning I am who he created me to be. I am who he says I am. But that sounds too easy, doesn't it? Well, it really is that simple for me, and it can be that simple for all those that turn to Christ for their answers. Uh, because I've had the benefit of growing up in a home where I was taught and encouraged to believe that God created me out of love, he also created me to have a personal relationship with him. That's pretty simple, and it can be that simple for everyone. I know that I cannot experience peace, happiness, and contentment without embracing who I am in Jesus Christ. Because you see, I am who he says I am. And it can be that simple. But how do I know it's that simple? How can I prove that it's that simple? Well, let's look at what God's word has to say about that, about who we are. So we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. We read them last week, hoping that your minds would perk on a little bit this week. So you can follow on the screen above me or in your Bible or on your app. Colossians 3, chapter 1 through 11. And there's a lot of good stuff in here that I won't be tearing apart, so you might want to look at it again this week in your personal devotions. And uh, tear it apart for yourself and let God speak to you. But read with me. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. Now the closest I've ever come to questioning my place in the world was when I got married and then became a parent. When I got married, first off, I had to readjust to a different name. I went from being a single woman, this miss, to being Mrs. Wilson. See, I had to give up the name that I'd been born with, the name that I was attached to, a name I really liked. But I gave it up because I loved this man so much that I wanted to spend my life with him. I wanted to be his. I wanted him to be mine. I wanted to make a life with him. And so this name change was a great joy. Even though I had to readjust to the new and the different circumstances that marriage and eventually being a parent brings, I was still the same person after marriage down deep that I was before the marriage. Bib biblically speaking, you could say that I took off the old single self and put on the new married self. Notice I did not say old married self. And this is a good example in life, how, how our circumstances change, and they will change. But who we are remains the same. Now we can change how people perceive who we are, but we're really, the personality we have, that's who we are, that person inside. So am I saying that people cannot change? No. We have been given the ability to choose what we do, what we say, how we act, how we treat others, and that, in essence, can change how we appear to others. The most important gift that we've been given is the freedom to choose to be whom God created us to be or not. So basically saying, we get to choose who we appear to be. And we can choose to change how the world perceives us. We can be good, we can be bad, we can be educated, we can have a high paying job, or we could be homeless. 
We can have high morals or low morals. We can serve others or demand to be served. But y'all get what I'm saying here. We choose. We can change our outsides. We can change how people perceive us through our actions. But only God can change what makes us who we really are. Who God created us to be. And yes, there are a lot of good people in the world that are not Christ followers. And that doesn't take away from all the good things that they've accomplished with their lives, but it does limit what they do. It limits them to doing stuff that only matters in this world. That stuff won't last. And besides that, someone else is going to come along behind them and do something bigger, greater, better, you know, new and improved. It's always there. Life is always changing. Their accomplishments have no eternal value. And while what they accomplish may make the world a better place, there's already a better world being prepared for all of those that identify with Christ as their Lord and Savior. So how can we know who we are? Well, the answer lies in what is said and what is not said in verse 1 of our scripture this morning. Paul starts out by saying that we have been raised with Christ. What is not said is that to be raised with Christ, that means you first had to die out to self so that you could be raised. Because it's, it's intimating being raised to new life. Okay, We can only be raised to Jesus Christ when we die out to self. So what this means is that to find our true identity, we have to die out to self and be remade into a new creation. You know, when I entered the church that day on my wedding, my wedding day, I walked down the aisle and I was miss. I was miss. But when I walked out of the church that day, I had been remade. I was no longer miss. I was now missus. I was a new Creation. Marriage did not take away my personality, nor did it make me a better person. But my marriage gave me a new identity. Dying out to self means allowing Jesus to become our identity. When we allow Jesus to take first place in our lives, he gives us a new identity. As a Christ follower, we, be, we become more like him every day, and that's our identity evolving into what it was created to be. Now, in all that we read, did you notice the things that Paul lists that tell us who we are when our identity is found in Christ? To see our identity in Christ, Paul says here we have to put to death our earthly nature. That's those things that aren't Christ-like. Things like sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. These are the things that are very easy for us to put before God in our lives, which, if it's before God, then it's an idol. It's idolatry. You see, idols are anything, anything that comes before God. What comes first in our lives, what's the most important thing in our lives, that's what we worship. And that's what makes it idolatry. Christ should be first, then all this other stuff. Our identity in Christ also means that we love others because Christ, he loves them. And when we love others, uh, we will not want to have attitudes in our lives that destroy our loves for others, that destroy our relationships. Paul mentions another list here. Attitudes like anger, rage, malice, slander, and ugly language. Now the word there in verse 8 was actually filthy language. I changed it to ugly because that's such a broad statement. Filthy could mean anything from foul and indecent to just mean. Okay? It's ugly language, mean language. It's words that are intended to degrade or to tear down or to destroy another person just because we're angry or we disagree with them. So filthy language is ugly language. When we know who we are, we no longer have to lie to each other either. Why? Because the truth sets people free. When we love each other, it's expected. When you love somebody, it's expected that you tell the truth to that person, right? You don't lie to them or you destroy your 
trust. We tell the truth to those people we love. We tell the truth in love. We don't tell the truth to tear them down or to harm them. You see, all these issues that Paul is talking about here, these are issues that Satan uses to control our thought lives. And our thought lives are where our actions begin. See, what we think about, what we dwell on in our minds, eventually that comes out of our mouth or we act upon it. But if we find ourselves in Jesus Christ, then Jesus help us, helps us overcome all these issues through the power of the Holy Spirit. When we receive the Lord as our Savior and follow him for our identity, he gives to us the Holy Spirit who's with us constantly, guiding us and renewing our minds in what we know of Jesus Christ. When we find ourselves in Jesus, we are never without help. We're never alone. We're never overlooked. When we establish our identity in Christ, we gain help and power to overcome the world. Now, in verse 11, we read a list of people that we are not. While everyone is different in some way, people are also the same. But God does not see race, color, gender, finances, political standing, education, or even fame. God created us as a unique individuals uh, but when we allow ourselves to be adopted by Christ, we become his children. And God has no favorites among his children. We all become one in the family of God. And that is something that so many people, especially these last two generations, are searching for, equality. God loves his children equally. And I love how Paul tells us to set our minds on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And this is key to our daily existence in the world where Satan reigns. As Christians, we're to live our lives constantly looking up where Jesus is, looking up to find our direction, looking up so that we know where to follow. And as long as we continue to look to Jesus, then we can't be looking down at what everybody else is doing we can't be looking around to see what we have that's better than theirs or what we don't have. If we're focused on looking up at Jesus, we cannot be focused on the world. Bottom line, when we find our identity in Jesus, we die and we're hidden in Jesus. We become who he says we are and he says we are children of a king. Now, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21, is kind of lengthy, and I'll, I'll read it kind of fast, but it holds one of my favorite descriptions of my identity in Christ. Paul was praying for the Christians in Ephesus, and they were in need of prayer, and so are we. So uh, follow along with me on the board, Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his holy, through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within you, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You see, the benefit of having our identity found in Christ is that we don't have to wander around trying to figure everything out. We don't have to accept all the different opinions that the world offers. We don't have to try every new thing to see if that's where we fit in. We don't have to work at deciding who we are. Who we are has been shown to us through the example of Jesus Christ. Who we are has been spelled out for us in the Word of God. Who we are can be rooted and established if we will but choose to follow Jesus and let him dwell in us. When Jesus lives in us and we allow him to be first in our lives, the choices that we make about who we are gets really simple. Because we no longer have to decide certain things about ourselves. When our identity comes from being in Christ, we can easily know who we are. We are co-heirs of Jesus Christ. Now you may be thinking, what is, what is a co-heir? Well, a co-heir is a person that legally inherits stuff passed down from the owner. 
Now, God is the owner. He's the creator. He's the ruler. And Jesus is his son and the inheritor. But we, when we're adopted into the family of, of God, we will also inherit the kingdom of God. In Romans chapter 8, the Holy, Sp Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write this. He said, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Did you hear that? It's not always easy being who we're supposed to be. But once we know we, who we are, then God also provides for us the answer of, what is my purpose? Why am I here? What should I do with my life? Purpose is another area that sends people down a rabbit trail. You know, maybe I should be doing this, or maybe I should be doing that, or maybe I should try this, or maybe I need to stop that. Maybe I need to get someone to tell me what they think I should be doing with my life. And best of all, what does the internet say about what I should be doing with my life? As older people, not that I'm old, mind you, but as older people, we can kind of chuckle at that. But it is amazing how many people go to the internet for the answers to what they should do, how they should act, what their practices should be. These are real considerations for the younger generation. And when you think about it, it's always easier when someone else is making decisions for you, especially those things that you're unsure of. In fact, I wish I had, uh, I would love to be able to afford to have a cook that would plan my menu every day and I wouldn't have to think about what I cannot and can eat. That would really help me. But God has not seen fit to entrust that kind of money to me, so I have to make those decisions. When someone else makes decisions for you, it's always easier. Knowing our purpose is the benefit, though, of having our identity rooted and established in Jesus. He tells us, shows us, inspires us, gives to us our purpose. Jesus came with a purpose. Jesus came and he brought the gift of salvation, this free gift through his life, through his ministry, through his death and resurrection. His mission or his purpose was to get people into a right relationship with God so that they might be co-heirs and inherit eternal life. The purpose of Jesus is the purpose of all those people who find their identity in him. Jesus' purpose is my purpose. I was watching a... Uh, it wasn't really a documentary, it was a film, but it was the life story of Mahalia Jackson. You may have seen it, it, it was very good. Um, she was a great black gospel singer, and she'd earned the title of Queen of Gospel. Uh, she believed that God had called her to sing for him, and only him. And she did do that till the day that she died. But all of her life, people tried to get her to sing other styles of music that they felt best befit this great, talented voice that she had. But she never gave in. She always refused to sing any other music other than gospel music. And when it came to the end of the program, and God did bless her. God doesn't always bless us, but he did bless her. But she was willing to pay the cost to be who God created her to be. He came to the end of the program and she said this. She said um, that God had always, that she knew that God had always called him, her to sing for him. But after, you know, walking these many years with him and going through her life, she'd realized that her great voice was not God's gift to her. God's gift to her was her purpose. So no matter what we may see as great and valuable to the world may not be our purpose. And if we don't go about fulfilling our purpose, then we will never be fulfilled. We won't feel fulfilled. We won't have the happiness and the joy and the peace that comes with accomplishing the purpose why God created you. So ask yourself if you need to, for what purpose did God create you? Our scripture this morning clearly points out that our purpose is found in, in Jesus Christ. Our identity is found in Jesus. We must daily die out to what we think 
about ourselves and to what we think our purpose is and trust in who God says we are. Now you may be asking, how do I die out to self? I mean, what does that really mean? Well, to find that out, let's read uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, which is the rest of the chapter where we, were, we started at, and Robert read it from the pulpit this morning. Read with me, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bear with each other, and forgive one another of, of it. Forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or or deed. Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Because we are loved, we are to love. Everything we do and say is to be motivated out of a heart of love. And love has many facets. I'll, I'll give you that. Sometimes love is easy and sometimes love is hard. But in these verses, we learn that love is compassionate. Love is kind. Love is humble. Love is gentle. Love is patience. Now, I, I think compassion and kindness are, are the easiest of those things, but uh, being humble and gentle, and most challenging, being patient. See, these are the qualities that God will produce in us when we allow him to transfer our lives into the likeness of Jesus, when we allow him to form our identity, who we are. And forgiveness and love is the foundation of our identity in Christ. Love and forgiveness are tied together. To forgive means to love. To love means to forgive. And we do this because God first loves us. And because God forgives us, everything that we do, everything that we ask, we find our answers from him. When we find ourselves, when we establish our identity in Jesus, when we find God's love for us, then we receive the power to overcome whatever comes our way. So why is love so important? Because love binds all these virtues together, all the good parts of being a child of God. If you don't love, you don't have Christ in your heart. If you can't love, then you're, you're not in Christ. If you can't forgive, then you've not established and rooted your identity in Christ Jesus. Verse 17 tells us, that uh, whatever we do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Love that verse. Memorize that verse. It's a key verse. When we do good things, we please God. Doing good things out of love, we worship God. When we worship God, we're expressing thanks. So when we act according to his principles, being compassionate and kind and humble and gentle and patient, we're worshiping God, which is giving thanks to God. And that is a part of our identity as a child of God. Now I'm going to close with this. If you're, if you're looking for who you are within yourself, all you're going to find is how you appear to others. Because who you are really boils down to whose you are. As I said earlier, I walked down the church aisle as miss. I was only accountable to me and God. But I walked out of that church accountable to me and God and my husband. If I had remained only accountable to myself, if I had not embraced this new me, then my marriage probably wouldn't have lasted. And it for sure would have been filled with tension. And yet there's been rest and peace for me in my marriage because I embraced this identity of being a married woman, married to this one man. If you'll look to Jesus for who you are and only to Jesus for who you are and then embrace that, then you too can find peace, rest, and contentment. It's tough when who you are is only what you do or what other people tell you, what other people think about you are. Paul tells us in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, 
For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier with the dividing wall of, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit, and consequently you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises up to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by the Spirit. These verses, in these verses that we read, God gives us peace when we find our identity in him, in Jesus. That God's purpose was for his creation to want to love him, to want to be adopted by him, to want to be joined together with all other Christians into one big happy family. God promises to tear down barriers between us if we will let him. So, who are you? And most importantly, whose are you? Pray with me. Lord, I have no idea who these words were meant for this morning, but you do because you laid them on my heart. In fact, I believe that there are many, many people who need to hear these words this morning, these words that tell them that if they will give their hearts and live their lives for Jesus and find themselves rooted and established in Jesus, they will find the peace, the rest, the contentment, and the joy that they're looking for. I believe that these words can set people free from the struggle of trying to be something that they're not, free from trying to measure up to those around them, free from trying to conform to ways that make them feel uncomfortable, that free them from living a lie. So Lord, I ask this morning that these words will find open ears to hear and, and eyes to see where you're working around them and in them. For we have so much to be thankful for. Every day is a gift. Every day is an opportunity to become a child of the king, adopted into the one family that has an eternal inheritance. Jesus, just want to thank you for coming and dying on a cross so that we could see love in action. I want to thank you for the ability to be in your hands, to be your hands, to be your feet in the world as we express love, this love that you give to us by serving others. So may your name be praised in our lives today as we live according to who we are meant to be. Amen. Thank you.